In my mind, the way I thought theology was over here, the study of God, and the body and sexuality was way over on the other side. I found this teaching called the theology of the body. And here was this Polish philosopher and theologian who was saying, no, spirituality and sexuality go together. Theology of the body is nothing but a reflection on that God himself took on flesh to reveal through the human body his own eternal mystery of love. This is like the the biggest kept secret of Christianity. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we have a very special treat. We're going to be talking to somebody whose work I have followed for over a decade. His name is Christopher West of the Theology of the Body Institute. He's an author, a speaker, and a podcaster, and has really done some incredible work in the philosophy and theology around sex. So we talk about sex on the podcast. I debate about it on other podcasts and shows. This is something that is a common theme because it has so much to do with relationships, how we live them, how we live our lives. Today we're going to get into what is is the design of sex. Why do we know about sexual ethics from sex? What do we know about those things? The philosophy and the theology, particularly the theology of the body, it's called. Um, we're going to talk about things like orgasm. We're going to talk about uh, contraception. We're going to talk about natural family planning and so much more. This is an episode for adults, or you can share this with your teens. This is something that maybe if you're listening to this with kids, it may not be appropriate with young children just because we're going to talk about some of the brass tacks around sex and sexual ethics, but I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. Everylife.com is America's pro-life diaper company. These are high-performing diapers and wipes for your little one. I think you're going to love the product. They are great diapers. We've ordered a lot of diapers at our house, and Every Life does not disappoint. What's so wonderful about everylife.com is you're not only getting a great diaper and wipes, and they have other products that are coming, so check it out, but that everylife.com is a pro-life diaper company. They support your values, and they donate some of their proceeds back to the pro-life movement, including groups like your favorite live action. So check out everylife.com today. You can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. Order that bundle of wipes and diapers for that new little niece or nephew in your life, your new son or daughter, your friend's baby. It's a great gift. They also have these cute new mom baby boxes. Check it out at everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. Christopher West, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Lila, it is my pleasure to be with you and your audience. <laughs> All right. I have known about your work for uh, well over a decade. I think even before becoming Catholic, I found your books or your writings or your speeches online. I don't remember exactly my first introduction, but you have been so influential and instrumental in me understanding I think God and his love and then his plan for sexuality and, and so much more. So thank you, first of all, for You're your heroic welcome. work in the church. It's been amazing. Thanks be to God. I, I have to pinch myself sometimes that I get to do this. <laughs> I have the best job in the world. I, I just like to say I invite hungry people to a banquet. That's mm. what I do. I love that. I love that. So tell me, first tell our audience, we have obviously Catholics who listen, evangelicals, Protestants, we have people that don't have a specific faith background. Tell me, tell us, our audience, a little bit about your background. Yeah, I was raised in, uh, as a Catholic in the 70s and 80s. I was born in the late 60s. Uh, and the way I put it, the, the working metaphor is I was raised on what you might call the starvation diet gospel. <laughs> The basic message was, your desires are bad, they're only going to mm -hmm. get you in trouble, so you need to repress all that and follow all these rules, and you'll be a good, upstanding Christian citizen. And I don't know about you, Lila, but I was really hungry, and I still am. Like, there's this ache that I have known in my humanity, this hunger for something. So the starvation approach was not going to cut it for me. And I became a quick convert in my teenage years to what I call the fast food gospel. And by that, I mean the secular culture's promise of immediate gratification for that hunger. And let's be honest, if there are two choices are starvation on the one hand or fast food on the other, if you're hungry like I am, you're going to go for the chicken nuggets. And, and don't lie to me because they taste really good going down, right? But Especially with Diet keep Coke. with that metaphor. <laughs> <what>? <laughs> good fizzy Diet Coke, absolutely. 
But if you stay with that metaphor, if fast food becomes your steady diet, mm. how are you going to feel after a while? You know, eventually the grease and the sodium is going to catch up with you. And that's a picture of me in my college years. So now we're in the late 80s, right? I was a freshman in college in 1988. And I did an experiment one weekend in college in 1988 that changed my life. And it's the reason I'm talking to you here today because of this experiment. I decided to stay sober for one weekend because I was beginning to see the cracks in the lie. Like, uh, put it this way, if, if the culture is selling you a counterfeit version of the human story and of human happiness, at the same time, it has to sell you all kinds of numbing agents to keep you from recognizing the pain you're in. And I was just looking at what was going on every weekend at college, everybody getting drunk. And I started thinking, what are we hiding from? Why do we have to be drunk in order to pretend we're having a, a good time? So just based on that, I didn't have any faith conviction at this point. I had left my Catholic upbringing. I was just indulging my desires however I wanted with all this fast food, so to speak. But I decided I'm going to stay sober one weekend. And man, were my eyes opened. I, I went to this party and I saw everybody getting drunk and I saw hookups happening and People were not having fun. They were miserable. And then I come home to my home or to my dorm room and my roommate comes back and he's terribly drunk and he vomits all over our room. It smells so bad. I grab my blanket and pillow to find somewhere else to sleep. And as I'm leaving, I look back and I think, is this guy having fun? He's passed out in a puddle of his own vomit. Is this fun? I find an empty room down the hall. I, I put my pillow and blanket on the floor. This guy comes back to his room, doesn't know I'm on the floor, and he has a girl with him. And I won't get into the painful details, but I witnessed some things that nobody should ever witness and nobody should ever go through. Uh, this woman who he was with should never go through what happened that night. And it haunted me. This experience haunted me. Like, what is it in men that lead them to treat women as nothing but objects for their pleasure. Not that it doesn't go the other way. We know it goes the other way too, but this was the situation I was in, what I had witnessed. And it compelled me to hold a mirror up to myself and say, am I much better in the way I think about women, in the way I treat my girlfriend? Uh, and I had to realize, I, I had to face this hard fact that I wasn't much better than this guy that I witnessed really do some abusive things. And that put me on a journey of saying, okay, God, if you exist, you better show me why you gave me all these desires, because they're getting me and everybody I know into a hell of a lot of trouble. And there's a hell of a lot of pain in the world, and I'm experiencing it. And long story short, a few years later, in this journey, I'm seeking, I'm asking questions, I'm looking for answers. I discover the teaching of this crazy Polish guy Maybe you've heard of him, Pope John Paul II. Uh, he was the Pope of my childhood and still was the Pope at this time in the 90s. And I found this teaching called the Theology of the Body. I was like, Theology of the Body? What? I mean, in my mind, the way I thought theology was over here, the study of God, spiritual things, and the body and sexuality was way over on the other side. And here was this Polish philosopher and theologian who just happened to be the Pope who was saying, no, these things go together. Spirituality and sexuality go together. The divine and the physical go together. In fact, it's called Christianity, right? It's called the incarnation. Theology of the body, I came to discover, is nothing but a reflection on God himself, this dramatic proposal of the Christian faith that God himself took on flesh to reveal through the human body his own eternal mystery of love. And I came to discover from this crazy Polish Pope that Christianity is not a starvation diet. It's an invitation to a banquet. In fact, a wedding feast. 
And I, I was, what, 23, 24 at the time, Lila. This was 30 years ago. And, and I'm reading this, and I knew then I would spend the rest of my life studying this teaching and sharing it with the world. And that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. And your organization, Theology of the Body Institute, you do courses and certifications, and then you've spoken. I mean, you've probably spoken in, I don't, I'm going to guess, dozens upon dozens of countries across the the world probably at this point 50, or more. 50 countries around Amazing. the world. And yeah, um, it has taken me to the four corners of the earth. And I'll tell you, the number one response I get was the response that I had when I first discovered the theology of the body mm -hmm. is, I was raised in the church. How come I've never heard this? Mm. Why have I never heard this? That's the number one response I get. Uh, this is this is like the biggest kept secret of mm. Christianity. Uh, sad to say, but uh, it's like, well, as I said, I have the best job in the world. I just get to invite hungry people to a banquet. And when you've either been taking that starvation approach or you've been taking that fast food approach, when you lay out this banquet for people, it's it's life changing. There's one thing you mentioned earlier, and I do want to ask you because it, it it's you know unfortunately what you describe is all too common today you know on college yes. campuses, high schools. But you mentioned you know you had this one weekend you were going to be sober. You were you're in the room. All of a sudden your roommate you know comes in drunk. He, were they both drunk? It sounds like they both were. And you said you know you saw you heard things you never wanted to see or hear. What, just curious, your mindset, you know, I don't think I've heard you tell that story before, but your mindset there, because you didn't stop him or stop her, you know, you were, I don't know, half asleep. What, what was kind of yeah. going through you at that? What was Christopher at, I don't know, 19, how old you were at that point, 20 years old? Yeah, I was 19. I was 19. In, in that uh, moment, did you want to go like, my, yeah. My, in case my college roommate is listening, it wasn't him. I was in okay. another room down the hall. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it... No. I didn't want to get into those details necessarily, but I, sure. I will say this. Um, I remember hearing this female voice say, stop, stop. I'd only want to do this if I knew you loved me. Oh, wow. And then he said, I love you. I love you. And I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but he proceeded to have his way. Um and I should have gotten up and kicked the living S-H-I-T out of this guy. Mm. Uh, but I was, I was frozen. I, 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 I froze in my tracks. I was so stunned by what was happening. Mm. Um, it's, it's a moment I look back on with deep regret and sorrow. Mm. And I have to apologize to you, Lila, and to every woman on the planet that I did not get up and take action. Um, it's, it was a moment of disbelief i couldn't i couldn't believe what was happening and and I, I i experienced a kind of paralysis um i wish i could tell you i was heroic and i got up and stopped it but that's not the true story uh, i pray for that woman and i pray for that man to this day um it was a life-changing experience for me because it it compelled me to ask the big questions about human life human love human sexuality and, you know, the, the church is bold enough to speak of the happy fault of Adam that won for us so great a Redeemer. That, that horrible experience became something that God used in my life to, to, to take my life in a totally different direction. So we talk about, thank you for sharing that. We talk a lot on the podcast about sex, sexuality, uh, relationships, mental health, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the, our audience knows sometimes I go on podcasts and talk about these issues as well. And, you know, it can get really controversial today because there's a lot of different opinions about yes. sexual ethics. Obviously, you know this. Um, Let's start with, you mentioned Theology of the Body already and John Paul II, um, who is the best. <laughs> uh, and so I'm excited to introduce people who may not be as familiar on the show today to him through you. What is Theology of the Body? And then I want to unpack, <clears throat> see where the conversation goes, but unpack uh, how it is a, an answer in many ways to, or how it you know wrestles with the kind of prevailing yeah. notions about sex today. 
Yeah, I, I would like to talk about Theology of the Body, but I'd like first, if I, if you don't mind, to talk about another work of his that is the philosophical foundation of the theology. You know, every sound theology has a sound philosophy behind it. And the book that gives us the philosophy behind the theology might be a better starting point for your particular audience. I know we have a broad audience, not just Catholic, not just Christian, but uh, people who might not have any faith at all. And when we begin with philosophy, we can then point to theology from a, a place of common ground. Is it okay with you if I start Please there? Please do. Go for it. So Sounds in great. this book, Love and Responsibility, which is a philosophy book, he says the norm for all human behavior is what he calls the personalistic norm. Okay, not a term we use every day. What does he mean? He says, when we're discussing morality, and specifically sexual morality, we can't understand what sexual morality is unless we understand what the human person is. So when we say personalistic norm, we're going to zoom in on what is a person. And person is the word philosophers use to distinguish the human being from the rest of animal creation. We are animals, but we're not merely animals, right? And we know this by our experience that we're, we are an animal, but we're not merely an animal. There's something different between a human person and a chicken, right? Despite all the propaganda in the modern world where some people are saying chickens are people too, <laughs> we know there's a difference, right? If you're driving down the road and you see a chicken killed on the side of the road, you're not going to stop your car or call the police, right? But if you see a human person who's been hit by a car on the side of the road, you're going to stop your car and call the police. Why? There's something different. There's something different, something qualitatively different. Chickens do not look up at the stars and wonder what's out there. Right? Chickens do not write music or poetry. Chickens do not build cathedrals or skyscrapers. And nor do chickens get into airplanes and fly them into skyscrapers. What's my point here? We have something. The human person has something the animals don't have. Freedom. Freedom. What will we do with that freedom? In the world today, freedom is prized as an end in itself, right? It's, it's something we want to we hold on to. Whereas the philosopher Carol Wojtyla, who became Pope John Paul II, he says, rather, freedom is the means to love. And he says, human beings desire love more than they desire freedom. And when we find the truth about love, it is worth spending our freedom to have that love, right? So sometimes, you know, we'll say, I love my dog and my dog loves me. And okay, there's a certain sense in which we can use that word there. And, and one of the problems in the English language anyway, is that we use the word love for so many things, right? I love potato chips. I love my wife. Well, I hope there's a qualitative difference in the way I love potato chips and the way I love my wife. In other languages, they have many more words for the word love, so we can make these distinctions. But let's, let's zoom in on what is, what is the love between persons? In the strict sense of the word love, only persons can love. We have freedom as the means to love. What does it mean to love a person? Well, let's begin with its opposite. The personalistic norm says that the human being is the kind of being that may never be used as a means to an end. If we stop there and reflect on our own experience here, we know when somebody uses me as a means to an end, we feel violated. We feel not honored in our humanity. Uh, this is why slavery is wrong, for example, right? We don't think it's offensive to have a dog on a leash, but we do find it offensive to have a human being on a leash. Why? 
because that human being has freedom and the dog doesn't, right? The dog can be mastered by a person, but a person should never be mastered by another person. A person should never be used as a means to an end. So the opposite of love is not so much hatred. The opposite of love is to treat another person as a means to an end. If we understand that, we will understand everything the Catholic Church teaches about sexual morality. And I could say much more, and I will, but I just want to pause mm -hmm. there and see if you want to draw any other questions out of what I've said so far. You are a master, Chris, because the perfect timing. I was like, I got to ask him a question. I'm going to interrupt yeah. him if he keeps going. <laughs> um, so thank you. Yes. I, the, the, and here's the, you know, in culture, <clears throat> the word is consent that's used, right? Well, yeah, yeah. They, 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 people are with you. Yeah, it needs to be freely chosen, whatever, whether it's a sexual relationship or act or it's anything like I'm going to go and work for you at a coffee shop. Right. So as long as I'm freely cho choosing this thing that I'm doing and you're agreeing to employ me or, you know, in the sexual ethics world, you know, do this sexual thing with me, um, as long as there's consent, you know, freely chosen thing is chosen, we're good to go. Why is it still, even if there seems to be a free choice, still wrong to do certain things? Like, for example, someone could say, I freely am choosing to be your slave um, and I'm going to subject myself to maybe some degrading uh, treatment. Why are some things still wrong, even if they seem to be freely chosen? Well, the proposal here, and I'm not here to shove this down anybody's throat, but I'm holding it out for people to think about, right? And, and, I'm going to go right with John Paul II here, who says, weigh everything against your own experience. Yeah. Because in our deepest experiences, if we are in touch with those deepest experiences, and that's a big if, we will find a confirmation, I believe, of everything the church teaches about sex. If we look at our deepest experiences, and this is what I want to invite people to. I want to propose that the human being is the kind of being that is indispensable, is irreplaceable, and is unrepeatable. These are words I learned from John Paul II's philosophy, from his book, Love and Responsibility. And I'm going to unpack them so we can all be on the same page here. Indispensable, right? Things are dispensable. If your toaster breaks, you throw it away. And you don't violate the dignity of your toaster by throwing it away. But when you use a human person and then throw him or her away, if that person is in touch with his or her true dignity, it's going to hurt. Right? Let's any, any human being, let's, let ha, let's have any human person look at an experience where they were used and thrown away, where they were treated as dispensable. Man, it hurts. Why does it hurt? It hurts because the human being is the kind of being that is indispensable. That's a proposal. Weigh it against your own experience and see what you think. Indispensable, irreplaceable, right? Your toaster breaks, you throw it away, you get another one. You replace it with another toaster. And in fact, toasters are not only re dispensable, replaceable, they're also repeatable, which means you can get another of the very same model of toaster because there are a million of the very same toaster at the Amazon warehouse. The proposal here is that persons are different than things. Things are dispensable, replaceable, and repeatable. Persons are indispensable. It hurts when we get thrown away. Persons are irreplaceable. It hurts when we get thrown away and we get replaced with someone else. Just look at your own experience. Anytime you have been used, discarded, and replaced, it hurts. Why does it hurt? John Paul II's proposal is that when you feel that pain, you're recognizing your true dignity as a person because someone has violated that dignity. And when you are compared to someone else, you are being treated as if you were repeatable 
or comparable, right? Oh, why don't you just look more like so-and-so, my old girlfriend? Or if you would just behave in the bed like the girl I was in bed with last night, I would like you more. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're treating that person as a thing that can be compared to someone else. Oh, I don't like the way you you have sex in, in, in our relationship. I'm going to throw you away and get somebody else, right? What would our sexual choices look like? This is the proposal. What would our sexual choices look like if in every sexual choice we made, we upheld the dignity of the person as indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable? What would our sexual choices look like what the church is holding out to us here is not some oppressive list of rules to follow. What the church is holding out to us is the dignity of what it means to be human, that you are never meant to be treated as a thing to be used and thrown away and replaced with some other thing. You are a person and you are meant to be seen and loved and honored and treated as indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. When the sexual relationship is approached from that perspective, I think we have a common ground to enter into conversation with anyone on the planet to draw out of them the truth of who they are. Not impose from the outside some list of rules, but to invite them to reflect on their true dignity. That is the invitation. Seven Weeks Coffee is delicious gourmet coffee that can be shipped directly to your home. If you go to sevenweekscoffee.com, you'll learn the story of not only an amazing company that supports your pro-life values, but a company that creates and crafts some of the best and most gourmet coffee blends. I love drinking Seven Weeks Coffee because I'm not only getting an amazing cup of coffee, but I am supporting the pro-life movement every time I take a sip of Seven Weeks. Why is that? That's because as you guys may have heard already on the show, I've talked about it before, Seven Weeks Coffee gives 10% of their revenue, not just their profits, 10% of all revenue directly to Pregnancy Resource Center. So when you drink that great cup of coffee, you are directly supporting the care for mothers and babies in need. Seven Weeks Coffee is called Seven Weeks because that is when the baby at seven weeks pre-born is the size of, yes, a coffee bean. Check out Seven Weeks Coffee today. You can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. If you haven't already tried it, what are you waiting for? That's sevenweekscoffee.com. Use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. So here's the question then, uh, playing, you could say, a bit of devil's advocate. And I was just, I'm just yeah. came in off a, a debate on is sex work good for society, I think was the t the topic. And then I did another debate recently on another podcast, you know, should porn be banned and, you know, on and on. And, you know, the, the common refrain, the response, right, from those that are okay with, you know, we can call it sexual hedonism, they might call it something else, but is, well, you know, you consent to go work at a coffee shop, you might get fired at a coffee shop if you didn't do your job. That doesn't mean you're not you know, a, a valuable human being. It just means, or you, you know, you choose to quit or whatever it is, right? Why can't sex be the same? Why can't it be the same to, to choose to have sex or do a sexual act like you might choose to go work at a coffee shop or not? Why is sex different? Yes. Well, because the commodity being bought and sold at a coffee shop is coffee. The commodity being bought and sold in sex work is the human person. But they would the say they would say, hey, it's not because my commodity at the coffee shop. Yeah, there's coffee, but it's me serving the coffee. So in both scenarios, I'm serving sex or I'm serving coffee is what they, well, they would say. You, right, here's the dif distinction. Serving coffee, you are serving a product that is outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. But in serving sex, you're serving your own body and your body expresses your person. Right. The, the only mm -hmm. way we can justify treating the human body as a thing is to divorce the human body from the human person. And when we divorce the body from the person, we destroy the person himself or herself. That is the proposal. Uh, and no one can force that proposal on anyone, but the invitation is come and discover your greatness. Uh, this is a quote from John Paul II himself in his book, Love and Responsibility. In order to understand 
human sexuality, the human person must reconcile himself or herself with his or her greatness. Right? This is an invitation to recognize what a human person is worth. Right? A human person is worth a love that will never leave you, never forsake you, never replace you with another. Sexual love, this is the proposal, is only in keeping with the dignity of the person when we say to the person, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never replace you with someone else. I will never treat you as a thing to be used and dispensed with. You are a person and you have a value and a dignity by the very fact that you are a person. And if I claim to love you, I am going to spend my life defending, honoring, and upholding the dignity of your humanity, of your personhood. And people can say, well, I don't want to do that. You can use your freedom that way. But if you choose a life of not upholding the dignity of others, others are not going to uphold your dignity either, and you will feel the pain of it unless you are numbing yourself to that pain. Right? And I said that earlier, a culture that sells us a counterfeit version of the human story, of human happiness and human love, will at the same time need to sell us all kinds of numbing agents to keep us from recognizing the pain that we're in. I say, pay attention to your pain. Remove the numbing agents because that pain is instructive. It's telling you something. Right? If you, if you brush your teeth with a chainsaw, <laughs> there's going to be some indications that you shouldn't have done that. It's going to hurt, right? If you treat yourself and others as things rather than persons, things to use rather than persons to love, it's going to hurt. Pay attention to your pain. It's instructive. So if there's somebody who is, let's say, a professional singer or dancer, right, they're using their body in a very, you could say, I mean, intimate is is a tricky word because, you know, there's like sexual intimacy, but they're using their physical body to, to do an expression, whether it's yes, singing yes. Or, or dance, song or dance. Um, that they might come, you know, they might sell, they might monetize professionally, you know, uh, to make record or records, let's sure, sure. 1990s, <laughs> digital, you know, sell digital music or, you know, become a professional dancer and, you know, sell their dance routines or be a dance instructor or whatever, right? What is it, you started with philosophy, which is so smart, you know, you, you start with that before you get to the theology, but what is it yeah. ontologically that is different about I'm singing or I'm dancing or I am using my body to make coffee versus I'm using my body, my body is participating in sexual activity? Yeah, this is great. So we're going to go right, right to the heart of the matter. We have to talk about genitals. So you ready to talk about genitals? <laughs> go for it, Chris. There we Christopher, go. yes. <laughs> All right. And, and we, we're not, this is, again, this is just philosophy. This is not an appeal to theology or the Bible or anything. Eyes are meant for seeing. Did I say anything controversial there? Not, not so far. Keep going. Not so far. Okay. <laughs> Ears are meant for hearing. Have I said anything controversial yet? Keep, keep going. <laughs> Lungs are meant for breathing. Any problem with that? Genitals are meant for generating. All right, now we're getting people are, whoa, whoa we, genitals are meant for generating. What do you mean? I, I can do whatever I want with. Okay, in order for human life to flourish, we have to understand what a human being is designed to do, right? Why is it not controversial to say eyes are meant for seeing? It's obvious that eyes are meant for seeing. It's also, if we're honest, if we're on, that's a big if, if we are honest, it is obvious that genitals are meant for generating new life, right? When we talk about engaging our genitals, we're talking about the generative power and the generative power, the fact that sexual activity is connected fundamentally with the fundamental fact of existence, 
right? If it weren't for the sexual union of your parents, Lila, you would not exist. But not even just your parents, but also their parents and 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 their, the whole way back to the beginning of time, right? At the very foundation of human existence is genital union. When we forget that genitals are meant for generating, society can only degenerate. And this is the world we're living in right now. We are living in a culture that is degenerating because for the last hundred years or so, we have been hell-bent on separating our genitals from their generative power with modern methods of contraception. And when we are hell-bent on separating genitals from generating, we lose altogether the dignity, the splendor, the meaning, the fundamental purpose of human sexuality, and we end up treating the human body, which is to say the human person, as a commodity, as a thing, as a, an object to be bought and sold and used for my own personal pleasure. When the culture becomes utilitarian, pleasure becomes the main name of the game, right? This is the difference between a Catholic or a Christian vision of sexuality and a secular one. If we boil it all down, this is the difference. What the culture is trying, the secular culture is trying to uphold at all costs is the value of pleasure. What Christianity is trying to uphold at all costs is the value and dignity of the person. Right? When we say pleasure is our main value, the person becomes a means to pleasure. I'll stay with you as long as you give me pleasure. As soon as you don't give me pleasure, I'll throw you away and I'll replace you with somebody else. But now you've just violated the dignity of that person who is indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. The only way to honor sexuality in its integral wholeness is to receive it in its integral wholeness from the Creator, and the Creator designed us in such a way that sexuality enables us to co-create with Him. This is why we call our sexual organs genital organs, because they have the power to generate. When we look at human sexuality through condom-colored glasses, all of this value and dignity and meaning and purpose evaporates. That's the world we live in right now. So to do devil's advocate more here, because people yes. are listening to this and it's it's so uh, it's a beautiful vision. It's so compelling. But then there's that question. What about what about what about? And yep. the, the first one that comes it comes up is, OK, uh, so are you saying pleasure is not part of sex? It, aren't no. the sexual organs designed also for pleasure? And so uh, is, do you have to generate a new life every time you have sex for it to somehow yep. be the rightly ordered use of sex? Yes, we can see how the questions begin to multiply. And I would <laughs> urge people who want to do a deep dive on this to read John Paul II's book, Love and Responsibility, where he anticipates all of these questions and answers them in a very compelling way. I will try my best in the time frame we have to address some of these at least. What is the role of pleasure in the sexual act? Pleasure is a fruit, I would say, of loving rightly. Right? Now I'm going to get theological. Uh, as a Christian, I would put it this way. The new commandment that Jesus gives us is love one another as I have loved you. Right, And then he says, I tell you this so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. When we understand that that sexuality has a theological language, that we are meant to love as God loves with our bodies. And I would say, going from the philosophy now to the theology of the body, this is one of the greatest contributions of John Paul II's teaching, that the call to love as God loves, as Christ loves, is chiseled by God right in the sexual difference. And loving divinely, 
right? St. Paul will say to husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. A husband is meant to say to his wife in the sexual act, this is my body given up for you. Jesus himself said, if you are loving that way, there will be an intense joy, an intense pleasure will be the fruit of loving that way. But if we zoom in on pleasure as the fundamental goal of the act, right, the end of the act, the purpose of the act, now I'm using the other person as a means to my pleasure. And again, if we're going to subscribe to this philosophy, the personalistic norm says the human being is the kind of being that should never be used. The only proper response to the human being is love. If I don't care if it's your husband or your wife. If I'm treating my wife as just a means to my pleasure, I'm not loving her. I'm using her. And if she's in touch with her dignity, she will feel used. Simply being married does not justify sexual behavior. <laughs> it's only if you choose to love divinely that justifies sexual behavior. Then the pleasure that comes is received as a fruit of love, not as the end, right? Because if I treat pleasure as the goal, then the person becomes a means to an end. I think the difference in sexual, um, the sexual difference between men and women here is such an interesting thing to grapple with because you describe, you know, you mentioned if you're the, the fruit of a fruit of love can be pleasure, right? Yes. Um, but in a sexual act, you know, it's much easier for men to experience pleasure than women. You know, this is like a, a thing that's actually commented about in the secular world and in the Christian world, but they call it the yes. orgasm gap or they call it other things like that, where our bodies are just designed so differently that the ability to feel pleasure happens so differently. And for men, it's a much easier, shorter curve than for women. What does that say about this theology and this philosophy of yeah. ultimately love that you are explaining here? I'm so glad you brought this up. John Paul II, I kid you not, has an entire chapter in his book on love and responsibility dedicated to calling husbands to what he calls the virtue of tenderness. He says, te because of what you just mentioned, there's a sharper curve of arousal in the man biologically. It calls him to a tenderness with his wife to enable her to experience the full pleasure of the sexual act. And he gets right into some very, shall we say, nitty gritty details that come from his pastoral experience with couples. And he says, a husband who can at times be rather brutal in the sexual act in seeking his own pleasure. Mm -hmm. If he does not take into account the, 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 the longer curve of arousal in his wife and show her the proper tenderness that enables her to, with him, experience the fullness of joy in the marital act, such a man cannot be said to love his wife as Christ wow. loves the church. <laughs> so the invitation is to one of a deep, this is how he describes it. He says, rather than speaking of sexual technique, which is where, you know, this is where you get all the sex manuals on the bookshelf at Barnes and Nobles, right? He says, we don't so much need a sexual technique as we need a culture of marital relations, where a husband and a wife are learning to share their inner worlds with each other, where the physical act becomes a sacrament or an outward expression of a deep inner intimacy, a nakedness of the heart, if you will, right? He says, if the nakedness of the body does not have a corresponding nakedness of the heart, well, then there's the danger that we're just using each other for, for whatever kind of pleasure we're after. The goal is, is an intimacy of soul and heart that becomes expressed in the intimacy of the body. And if that culture of intimacy is fostered in that relationship, only when the wife knows she is loved, 
honored. She will never be treated as a thing. She will never be dispensed with. She will never be abandoned. She will never be used as an object. It's that knowledge of authentic love that enables her to open, relax, and God willing, with his tenderness, the tenderness of the husband, come to experience the fullness of joy in the marital act. And John Paul's very clear, if the wife does not come to experience this, there is a real danger of, of a resentment that can be built up in the marriage. Uh, and I'd urge anyone to read the, um, <laughs> let's just put it this way, he raised more than a few eyebrows when he wrote about this, and this was in the early 1960s that he was writing about this. Uh, he was a man ahead of his time, let's put it that way. Oh, totally. I mean, I, 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 most people, I think, are shocked when I've had conversations when they, when I've shared, yeah, actually, a pope, Pope John Paul II in the last century, thinks that, you know, it's it's a prime, prime importance for a husband to bring his wife to orgasm. And he, like, wrote about, that was something he took time to write about because it's like, wow, that, that they care so much. I mean, those Catholics or those Christians who don't care about sexual pleasure, they actually care so much about the unity that comes from sexual pleasure. Um, not just sexual pleasure, but the unity that's part of sexual pleasure or sexual pleasure is part of that unity that they would say it's important for both men and women to experience it fully in a marriage. Let, let me let me paint a picture this way. You're exactly right, Lila. The, the, the church is placing such a high value on the beauty, the splendor, the dignity of sexual relations. And I, I'd paint it this way. Let's take two pictures uh, let's start with a, I'm just going to speak from the male perspective because that's the one I know far better. Let's take a typical American teenage boy who's exposed to pornography at a very young age and he starts masturbating to the pornography and throughout his teenage years, that's his experience. Sexual stimulation through pornography mm -hmm. translated into masturbation. His whole psychosexual development is based on pleasing himself. Fantasy, image, fantasy, stimulation, selfish release. Let's suppose he's sexually active at some point in his teenage years, and he marries the woman that he's sexually active with sometime in his late 20s. And he's probably had multiple sexual partners, right? He goes into marriage and all his whole psychosexual development is conditioned by a masturbatory frame of reference, right? Woman is object to stimulate my fantasy life to indulge in my selfish pleasure. For him, the sexual act will be, unless he experiences a dramatic change of his heart, his sexual experience will, with his own wife will be one of using her to please himself. In other words, he will still be masturbating, except he will be using his wife's body as a means for his own masturbatory behavior, right? This is what the world thinks sex is supposed to be. And that's what I thought sex was supposed to be. Well, the world, the, 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 be, the world on feminism is at least, well, we're mutually masturbating, right? Like, yes, I'll yes, help you, well, but you yes. better help me. <laughs> yes, I'll use you, you use me. And I want to say to that world, you are made for so much more. There is another way to see. There is another way to think. There is another way to experience human sexuality in such a way that it corresponds to the deepest, most real desires of our heart to be seen, to be known, to be loved, to be affirmed as indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. I can speak from my own life here on both sides of that equation. I know the experience of using and being used, and by God's grace, I can say I have learned this art of loving. I have learned the art of seeing woman not as object for me, although I can still be tempted and even fall in that direction, but I have come to see woman as person made in the image of God, whose body reveals to me a stunning, 
glorious mystery to which I am deeply attracted in such a way that I want to honor her and uphold her in the fullness of her dignity. But we have to, to get there, we have to go through some real rearranging of the interior furniture, so to speak. And, and that's the work we do at the Theology of the Body Institute, to take people from that masturbatory mindset, a pornographic masturbatory mindset, to a, to a coming to see purely, right? And, and I love this line from Jesus Christ where he says, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see... God, this is what we come to see as our eyes get opened. We come to see the the message of God, a, a divine message, a divine story written by God right in the male and female body. There's nothing, truly, there is nothing more awesome than to see with your own eyes the theology of the human body. I have always had a hard time finding skincare products that I really liked and wanted to continue using. I've tried a lot of different products. So I was really excited to discover NimiSkincare.com. That's Nimi, N-I-M-I, skincare.com. What's so awesome about Nimi is it's a beautiful brand that shares our values. It's a pro-life, pro-family brand. But that doesn't mean necessarily the product is going to be amazing. So I tried the product a few months ago and I fell in love. Nimi Skincare has an amazing vitamin C cream that I love using, an evening moisturizer that I've been using, and I also really love their sunscreen. They have amazing products that are simple. The ingredients are no nonsense. They're listed on the website. You know what you're using on your skin, and the price point is great. So check out NimiSkincare.com. I think you're going to really enjoy their products. That's NimiSkincare.com, and you can get 15% off your order using the code Lila at checkout. I mean, so beautiful and so compelling. And I mean, learning about this was one of the reasons that I fell in love with the teachings of the church. And it was part of that whole journey for me uh, back to just misunderstandings or just questions or, uh, you know, the devil's advocate side of the side of things. What about you mentioned, I think, condom colored glasses, I think was the phrase you used. Very funny. Uh, what is the the answer to, okay, yes, sex is meant to be generative, but it's not generative every time, obviously. Yes, some yes. people are infertile. Some people are old, and so they are not able to generate anymore, especially women yes. if they're past menopause. So there is sex that is good that, you know, let's say within marriage is happening that is not generating. So why is it such a big deal at certain points, especially if there's a, a good reason for it to uh, do something to the sexual act to make it non-generative, i.e. use a condom yes. or use contraception. Yes, let's, let's jump right in. Uh, my wife and I have been married 28 years. We have five beautiful children, age 26 down to age 15. And it has only been God's will in 28 years of marriage for five <laughs> of the times we've come together for there to be new life. To our knowledge, it's only been God's will five, and I assure you, we've come together more than five times, right? So clearly, and we've never used contraception, not a once, I couldn't, it's unthinkable to me. I, I, would, I would rather be cut up in a hundred million pieces by a razor blade than ever render the sexual act sterile. Why? Because I have come to understand the message of God written into my and my wife's fertility. Well, my wife doesn't have fertility anymore. She's past childbearing years. So this is all part of God's design. As I said, God designs a woman's fertility and a man's fertility. He designs when they can come together and it can result in a child. And he designs it in such a way that most of the time, it is not his will for a child to come to be. The point is simply this. We are not the lords of our fertility. Fertility places us in the domain of God. Let's just pause on that for a moment. Fertility places us in the domain of God. God has given us a share. Astounding. God has given us a share in his own creative power. Lila, I want you to imagine that you were looking at the Milky Way galaxy and God gave you the power to create that Milky Way galaxy with him, would you not be 
astonished at your ability to create the Milky Way with God? Wouldn't that be awesome? Or suppose he gave you the power to create the Himalayas with him, like you knew that together with God, you created the Himalayas. Would that not be awesome? He's given us something far more astounding. He's given us the ability to co-create with him a human life. This fertility puts us on the plane, in the domain, in the playing field, if you will, with the creative power of God himself. Reverence, reverence is demanded here. Great reverence. This is the point. When human sexuality remains linked with fertility, it demands that reverence for the creator and the creature and the union of man and woman. When we, try, when we look at it through condom-colored glasses, that reverence evaporates, and all that is left is pleasure. Right? Not that pleasure in itself is bad, but when it's all that's left, the goal becomes pleasure. Let me give you two scenarios. Let's say, um, let's go back to, I don't know, the 1940s or the 1950s. This is pr prior to the pill, right? The pill is not even on people's radar at this point. If a guy said to a girl in 19, pick a year, 1955, if a guy said to a girl, I want to have sex with you, she could rightly assume, logically assume, oh, he wants to be the father of my children. He wants to start a family with me. He wants to commit his life to me. That would not be illogical in 1955. But today, if a guy says to a girl, I want to have sex with you, what does that mean? It means you're hot and I want an orgasm. The value, the value of sex is now placed on the amount of pleasure you can give me, right? The, the whole, if we could use um, an economic term, the economics of sex has changed. With Its value is no longer the family. The, the, the value of sex is no longer starting a family, committing my life to raising the next generation. The value in economic terms of sex today is whether you are hot or not, right? In other words, how much pleasure you can give me. The exchange is now one of pleasure rather than one of generating the next generation and committing our lives. What afforded that change? Modern methods of contraception afforded that change, primarily the pill. And when the pill doesn't work, what do we do? Well, we were just in it for the pleasure. We didn't want this pregnancy to begin with, so we'll kill the baby. What kind of world do we live in? We live in a world where we are willing to kill a human life to indulge my right to have sexual pleasure whenever I want it. That kind of economy of sex is destroying us because we have lost sight of the value and dignity of the person. And we have lost sight of the value and dignity of the person that may be generated by the genital activity we are engaging in. We have now placed pleasure as a higher value than the person. And when we place pleasure as a higher value than the person, the person is terribly degraded. The church has always said, Christianity has always said, no, the person has the higher value. Pleasure must be subordinate to the dignity of the person, not the person subordinate to the pleasure that I'm seeking. When we flip those, it's the difference between a culture of life and a culture of death. I, uh, it's so well said, what you're, uh, everything you're describing, Christopher, the you know, the the person who is, okay, yeah, they're with you, you know, what you're saying is so compelling, but but what about those cases where y you might need to use contraception for some serious reason, 
It's not that you want to never have children. It's not that you think yes. children is bad. It's not that you disrespect sex. You think it's holy. You think God created it. Um, you have reverence for the other person. You want to sacrifice for them. In fact, you might even be using the contraception because of the other person's, you know, mental health issues or physical issues. You know, all of these reasons, right, to justify in these circumstances. Yes, yes. Why, how can we have this hard line of saying, yes. well, contraception is always wrong? Yes, the end never justifies the means. You might have 101 good reasons not to bring another life into the world. Let's just take that as a given. You have a couple, they have a good reason not to bring another life into the world. Well, rendering the sexual act sterile is not the only recourse not to bring another life into the world, right? And, and let me talk about reverence. You said, I have reverence for sex, but I still want to contracept. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. I'd have to tell you, you don't have reverence for sex. You can't say, if you're looking at, I don't know, um, the Mona Lisa, uh, you can't claim that you have reverence for the Mona Lisa if you take a razor blade to it, right? You can't claim that you have reverence for sex if you are rendering it sterile, you are, you are erasing, you are defrauding the sexual act of the way God created it to be. In fact, you're, you're taking a razor blade to it. You're saying, I don't like the way God created sex. I don't like the fact that if we had sex tonight, you could become pregnant. So I'm going to demand that you render yourself sterile. Lila, how would you feel if your husband said to you, I'll only have sex with you tonight if you get a nose job. I don't like your nose. I don't like the way God made your nose. Get a nose job and then I'll have sex with you. Is it any different for a man to say to his wife, I don't like the fact that you are fertile. I don't like the fact that if I had sex with you tonight, you could conceive. So here, insert this diaphragm or get on the pill. What you are saying you can't get it. You can't escape from this. What you are saying is, I don't like the way God made you, and I'm going to alter it, right? When Christ speaks of committing adultery in the heart, I want to zoom in on that word adultery. It ad alter comes from the Latin, to alter, right? To adulterate something is to alter it from God's original intention, when we render the sexual act sterile, we are adulterating the sexual act. We are altering it according to God's original intention. Ends and means. Let's take an example that is not sexual, just for the sake of an analogy. Say you have two people who want to lose weight, and let's say they have a good reason, a just reason. It's not some fanatical situation, you know, it's, it's a legitimate reason I need to lose weight for medical reasons. You have one person who disciplines himself or herself in eating food, right? There's the piece of cheesecake, and the one person says, I'm not going to eat the piece of cheesecake. The other person says, well, it sure would taste good if I ate that cheesecake. I'm going to eat the cheesecake, but then I'm going to vomit it up. So I don't gain the weight. I get the pleasure, but I don't gain the weight. Contracepted sex is kind of like sexual bulimia. We want the pleasure, but we don't want the fruit, right? It's like eating the cheesecake and vomiting it up. Whereas you have a serious reason not to bring a child into the world. Okay, then don't engage in the behavior that brings children into the world. You're not an animal. You can control yourself. And so here we are back at the difference between animals and human beings. Why do we spay and neuter our dogs and cats? Why don't we just ask them to abstain? That's a question. Why don't we just ask our pets to abstain? Why do we they have to can't. spay and neuter them? They can't abstain. Mm -hmm. Ah, we can and if we say we can't, or we believe we can't, we've just reduced ourselves to the level of animals. Why do we have freedom? Freedom is given to us as the capacity to love. And John Paul II says in Love and Responsibility, 
whenever our sexual desires interfere with our call to love the other person, we must say no to them, right? And if my wife is fertile on a given night and we have a serious reason not to be bringing another life into the world, love demands that I abstain from that act that would bring children into the world. To engage in the act and defraud it of its procreative potential is to take a razor blade to the Mona Lisa. I would never in a million years do it. Take the razor blade to me, slice me into a thousand pieces. I will never dishonor God's good creation in my wife by demanding she render herself sterile. I will never do it because I see how beautiful she is as God made her to be. And I don't want her to change herself for me so that I can indulge and have an orgasm tonight. Not going to do it. I'm not going to treat her that way. I am going to have mastery of myself and say no to engaging in the sexual act out of respect and love for my wife and for her fertility. Well, the other aspect too of this is there's so much to love and to intimacy beyond sex. I mean, sex is this incredible and it's an incredibly unique way of living intimacy. You could say it's the most Correct. intimate thing you can do with another person, your body, their body. But you know, there's so much other. There's so many other ways a husband can love a wife, a wife can love a husband, and so I think that's another thing is we we have this obsession with sex as a culture where yes, sex should be on a pedestal, I think, but at the same time, there's so much more to human love than sex, and I think part of that is we as a culture don't get celibacy. Um, I think celibacy is scary and seems weird and odd, and I, I'd like to go there to kind of round us out here, Chris, because um, you know Christopher, because you know obviously in the Catholic tradition, there's the celibate um, priesthood, right? And the religious life. Um, you're celibate if you're not married. You know, everyone's called to celibacy who's not married, um, of course. And in marriage, you may be called to periods of celibacy. Can you talk about when it comes to the theology of the body yes. and the value of sexuality, what it means to be freely or fully alive sexually, even as a celibate? Yes, what we don't get in our culture today is what I would call self-mastery, right? We, we have this big line about sexual freedom in our world today, but what does the world mean by sexual freedom? It means do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, without ever saying no. Time out. Press into that, and we will discover that what the world promotes as sexual freedom is actually sexual addiction. Right? Is a man who cannot say no to alcohol free? Right? Will he be free by just binging on booze? That is not sexual, or that is not freedom with alcohol. That's enslavement to alcohol. Right? Freedom in the realm of alcohol means I know how to enjoy a drink within moderation and I know how to say no. Right? But addiction is what we're talking about here. When when the culture says sexual freedom press in it's actually sexual addiction right if you cannot say no to your sexual desires your yes means nothing you are not free there's another way to see there's another way to think there's another way to experience our sexual desires here and, and sorry, you know, sorry, be, to, sorry to interrupt here but i think yeah. this is some so, this is such a misunderstanding because you need food to survive. We cannot, our desire to eat is one that we should not endlessly ever say no to because we need nutrition to live yeah, and to breathe. Yeah. Nobody needs to have sex. No individual correct. needs to have sex to live. And correct, I think that's what the modern mind is like, oh no, some people think I need sex to live. And what you're saying, it sounds like is that's not a need, that's an addiction that you have. Yes, that becomes, if you, if you feel like you need sexual release, like you need three meals a day, and you indulge in those needs as if you are free, you are not free, you are enslaved, right? I remember as a teenage boy when I thought I was sexually liberated and free because I had tossed off the oppressive shackles of my Catholic upbringing and I was indulging my lustful desires whenever I wanted. I thought I was free until I realized I couldn't say no to my sexual desires. I was enslaved by them, and I called slavery freedom. 
What is the freedom to which the human person is called? It is the freedom to be in control of my desires so that I can put them at the service of what is true, good, and beautiful. And here's an analogy I often turn to. Anyone can walk up to a piano keyboard and just bang on it and make meaningless noise, right? But it's going to grate against the ear, right? Mm. A concert pianist can also walk up to a piano keyboard and spontaneously tickle those keys and make music that lifts our souls to the heavens. But we know behind that spontaneity of the beautiful music is a lifetime of training, of discipline, of sacrifice, of learning to master my own body, to put it at the service of what is true, good, and beautiful, right? Let's apply that to our sexuality. Anyone can indulge sexual desire when it just comes upon the person, but that's like banging, banging on a keyboard and making meaningless noise. We are called to take that sexual energy and learn how to master it, to put it at the service of the true, the good, and the beautiful. That will take discipline, that will take training, that will take struggle, that will take effort, but it is a constructive effort, like the effort of an athlete who knows, like a Michael Jordan, who can fly through the air and dunk that ball with grace and beauty and skill, or a concert pianist, the, the sacrifice behind that. We're talking about a constructive self-discipline that makes us master of our own body so that I can put my sexuality at the service either of one person for the whole of my life, namely my wife, and the offspring that would come from our union, or I could also put my body totally at the service of the kingdom. Now, that's a theological word. What do we mean? Jesus says, some remain celibate for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Here we're going to go theological. We've been talking mostly on the philosophical side. Now we're going the theology of the body. We have to look at Scripture here from beginning to end. The Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman, but it ends in the book of Revelation with the marriage of Christ and the church, God and humanity. And what we learn when we're reading the Bible with our theology of the body lenses we learn the whole Bible can be summarized with five words. God wants to marry us. And he wanted that eternal marital plan to be so plain to us, so obvious to us, that he chiseled an image of it right in our bodies when he made us male and female and called the two to become one flesh. And so St. Paul tells us that this union in one flesh is a mega mystery, and it refers to Christ in the church. Christ came and took on flesh to be one in the flesh with us forever. Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman. It ends with the marriage of Christ in the church. The whole purpose of this marriage, the marriage that starts the Bible, is to point us to the eternal marriage of Christ in the church. And this is why Jesus says, in the resurrection, at the end of time, in the final reality, men and women are no longer given in marriage. Why? Because you no longer need a sign to point you to heaven when you're in heaven. The union of man and woman in one flesh, husband and wife, in their intimate embrace, it is the main biblical image of the heavenly reality that awaits us on the other side, where we will be one in an eternal communion with God forever. We don't need a sign to point us to Disneyland when we've arrived at Disneyland, right? <laughs> We're there. Only in this context can we understand why Christ calls some to remain celibate for the sake of the kingdom. It is celibacy for God's sake. It is not celibacy for God's sake. 
It is a choice to give my entire life to that eternal reality. I'll tell a story here that I hope will make the point. There was a, uh, a very wise Carmelite nun who was giving a lecture at a secular university. And she was trying to explain that as a celibate woman in her intimate life of prayer with the Lord, she experienced what the saints call nuptial union with love eternal. Well, this agnostic psychologist comes up to her after her presentation and says, you're sick. What you really want is sex, but you're disguising your desire for sex with all this ridiculous talk about union with God. She said, oh, no, no, no. I beg to differ. What the whole world really wants is union with God, but it's disguising that desire with all this ridiculous sex. Who do you think was right? <laughs> what you're describing reminds me of the Caravaggio of Mary Magdalene, who's in ecstasy. And the idea there is she had lived a life of sin and, you know, had experienced this physical orgasm, but now she's experiencing something even greater, which is a spiritual ecstasy. Yes, and it's actually that's, Teresa of Avila, Caravaggio's, or, or, or maybe, no, I know it's Bernini's Teresa of Avila. I'm thinking of, you have, You know, yes, yes, Caravaggio's Mary Magdalene. You're exactly right. I have that but now in my mind. But, but you're right. There's another one of Teresa of Avila. Yes, this is, this is part of the mystical tradition of the church. Mm -hmm where we can learn how to direct eros would be the right word e-r-o-s direct that passion and yearning for love and union we can learn how to direct it towards love eternal right and the first one to teach us this is the blessed mother mary mary's virginal conception of christ is not a negation of her femininity or her being a woman. It's rather demonstrating that femininity, her sexuality, her womanhood can be opened directly to God. And what happens when she opens her sexual being directly to God? She conceives virginally God's son, right? The very foundations of Christian faith contrary to all the prudish ideas that get projected onto Christianity, at the very foundations of Christianity, we have a woman opening her fertility, opening her womb, opening her sexuality, directing her eros towards love eternal. This it, is Christian faith. And it also explains why it makes theological sense that Mary and Joseph would have been celibate in their marriage because their marriage, the the intimacy of their marriage was something out of this world, <laughs> truly. Joseph it was heavenly. And Mary, we'll put it this way, Mary was already living the consummation of the eternal marriage. Wow. To have had sexual relations with Joseph would have been a step backwards, right? Instead of going backwards and having sex with Joseph, Mary reaches out her hand to Joseph and says, Joseph, come with baby, I'm going to show you the eternal union. I'm going to take you into the ecstasy of these eternal nuptials. We are destined for this wedding feast, this eternal banquet. And what does Jesus say? He says, go into the main streets and invite everyone to starve to death. <laughs> no, that's not what he says. He says, go into the main streets and invite everyone to this wedding feast. That's why I said I got the greatest job in the world. I just get to invite hungry people to a banquet. All right, last question, Chris, and this is something that a lot of people get hung up on. What is the difference between natural family planning and contraception? Some people say that NFP is basically Catholic contraception. Yeah, well, we were talking earlier about why do we spay and neuter our dogs and cats, right? Why don't we just ask them to abstain? Well, because they can't abstain. What is the principle of natural family planning? When you are fertile and you have a good reason not to have a child, you refrain, you use your self-mastery to refrain from the sexual act. Well, what about on another occasion when the woman is naturally infertile? Is there any reason you have to abstain then? Oh, come on. What is the big difference, people say, between sterilizing the act yourself and just waiting till it's naturally infertile? Both couples avoid children. The end result is the same thing, to which I respond. 
Oh, come on. What is the big difference between killing grandma and just waiting till she dies naturally? The end result is the same thing, dead grandma. Um, yes, the end result is the same thing, dead grandma, but let me point out a very significant difference. In one, you killed her. It's a serious sin called murder. And in the other, grandma is dead, but there's no sin involved whatsoever because her death is an act of God. Think about it, enter into this, spend some time with it, and you will recognize. If you can tell the difference between euthanasia and natural death, mm. you can tell the difference between contraception and natural family planning. It's the same difference. I'm not saying those who use contraception are guilty of murder. I'm not saying that. Rather, this is the analogy. In euthanasia, in, in natural death and natural infertility, God remains God. In contraception and euthanasia, we take the powers of life into our own hands and we make ourselves like God. Wasn't that the original mm -hmm. sin to begin with? Think about it. Enter into it. The Catholic Church is not crazy, and one day the whole world will see that the Catholic Church was not crazy, and this teaching will be vindicated. Prophetic words, Christopher. Okay, where can people find your amazing work? Go to theologythebody.com. To the, that's take it to the main website. My wife and I do a podcast called The Ask Christopher West Show, hosted by Wendy West. Uh, we have over 250 episodes. Uh, anywhere you listen to podcasts, just type in Ask Christopher West. Uh, we have a very active YouTube presence at the Theology of the Body Institute. Check us out there. Um, yeah, that'll, that'll take you up to the main places. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Christopher. Lila, it's my pleasure. Thank you for all the good work you do. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Please check out Christopher West's work. It's really phenomenal. I want to hear your guys' thoughts. We're going to keep on having these kinds of conversations on the podcast. So as always, you can leave a comment, send a message. You can email me at lila at gtbmedia.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and on our YouTube channel, wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Spotify, Apple, or elsewhere, leave us a review that helps the podcast reach more people. And of course, if you haven't already, join our locals community. We're so excited about our locals community. It's starting to grow. This is where we're going to have behind the scenes stuff. We're going to have special um, access for members. And this is where you can financially support the podcast so we can keep growing it and producing more episodes. Check that out at the link in the bio and we'll see you next time.